Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that first session for News Lit Camp. We're just going to let people kind of find their way to the appropriate Zoom. And then we'll get started. Everyone is enjoying their Friday, um, especially the Friday before Halloween. I'm clearly ready. <laughs> All right, people are still trickling in, so we're just going to give folks a minute. Right. So while folks find the appropriate Zoom, um, again, welcome to the second session of today's Newslet Camp. Um, my name is Alexa Bolland. I'm NLP Senior Manager of Educator Professional Learning at the News Literacy Project. I'll also be acting as your moderator for this session. Um, but before we get started, just a couple of really quick webinar pointers. Um, because there are quite a few of us, um, you know, throughout this Newsly camp today, uh, we uh, and the chat can sometimes get a little overwhelming. We do have the chat turned off. Um, so if you do have a question, which I really hope you do and will, I really want you to use and encourage you to use that Q&A button. Uh, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, a few other kind of frequently asked questions that we get. Yes, this is going to be recorded. Um, and all of the uh, resources that are going to be shared today will also be made available to you uh, in a resource package that will come to you via email. Uh, now, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Tiana Woodard. Uh, Tiana is the inaugural Report for America Corps member at the Boston Globe. Her reporting on Black Bostonians uh, relocating to the South and inequitable ticketing policies around the city's mosques earned her two awards in Report for America's 2023 Local News Awards. Uh, she's also part of the Globe's Money, Power, and Equality team. Um, writing stories on the racial wealth gap in greater Boston. Uh, Tiana is going to talk to us today about the role of being a community reporter and the balancing act that it takes to cover your own community. Uh, so Tiana, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so the floor is now yours. Thank you so, so much for having me. Good morning, y'all. Um, thank you for not only spending your morning, but also your Friday morning with me. So. I hope this can be like an energizing thing that can like pick you up into Halloween weekend or whatever you have planned. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, and I am um, Alexa, can you see it? Or I hope that everyone will be able to see it right now. Yep. Looks great. Okay, okay perfect. Um, yeah. So good morning, everyone. As Alexa mentioned, my name is Tiana Woodard. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I cover black communities at the Boston Globe and Today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about of kind of what it means to cover the community that you yourself are a part of and kind of how that gives me the flexibility to kind of, I would say, challenge what you can traditionally would call journalism ethics or objectivity and neutrality, but also some of the challenges or some of the sacrifices that might come with that. Um, and as Alexa mentioned, like, I really want this to be a conversational, um, a conversational like um, session, and I hope that you. I don't have a lot like in these slides, and hope that this can be filled with a lot of questions or anything that you might be curious about as educators. So, feel free to drop these in the Q and A as I'm going along, and I'll also be like breaking to see if there's any questions based on what I've shared with you so far. Yeah. Um, so to start off, just as a community reporter, I thought it would be important for me to share the perspectives and just how me and myself and just my upbringing has informed the work that I do. So even though I cover um, communities in greater Boston or in New England, per se, I'm a Southerner at heart. Um, I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and I moved to a city called Beaumont, Texas. It's about 30 minutes from Louisiana um, and an hour and a half east of Houston, spent like moved there when I was 10 and that's where my family is based right now. So I'm coming in as a Southerner covering um, black communities in Boston. And I went to the University of Texas and graduated with journalism and English degrees and about two years ago and started at the Globe. And just as a little thing here, um, I have an Airedale Terrier named Pierre and 
even though he's very ferocious and I think he's all bark and no bite, he is terrified of owls, like just flies. So whenever there's flies in our house, he will like <laughs> run or just be in a corner and absolutely not communicate with anyone else. And just some pictures here, like starting from the left, um, that's my dad and my dog, Pierre. Um, and then on the right, I have three or I have four older brothers, but I have three that I grew up with, they're all triplets. So that's um, us at my brother's wedding um, and us doing our like traditional pose. And then in the bottom right corner is my mom and my niece, AJ, she's six months at this point. And I kind of just wanted to share that because like, when I like see all these people, like my parents and my brothers and my niece, like um, traditionally, like I did not come from a family that was like, we're gonna have the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal open at every like morning breakfast or this or that. Like my parents did not really consume much media at all, like except for what they might have on their local TV station. Um, so I'm also like kind of bringing those perspectives in the sense of like, how can I get my journalism to appeal to people that may not have like a, a a background or a driven interest in news even though they're just as important and I think should guide the stories that we're telling yeah um and then so I really just have this like little um collage of photos about like growing up um this is what I really thought that journalism was and even through like my teaching or my um instruction at college I really thought that journalism was like this glamorous thing that you might see in like all the president's men with like um, Woodward and Bernstein, like um, exposing like presidential corruption or spotlight at the globe or just people like holding like institutions to account. And one of the things that I really got from this is that like um, you might be covering these, like you might be covering issues, but you're really supposed to like draw, draw a hard line between the issues or the topics that you're like covering. And there's not really any room to insert your own experiences or to really just bring a piece of yourself into those stories. So when I was like going through like college or um, even just growing up and considering like, could I do journalism? This, that was something that always deterred me or I was al always worried about where exactly I might fit. Um, and then like this next slide. So this is me um, with a story that I had um, published a few months ago with a local like Boston legend, Miss Jean McGuire. So pretty much like the background of this um, picture, um, Jean McGuire, she was like the first um, black woman to be elected to the Boston School Committee. And she was in charge of a program, METCO, which was like working on integrating schools or um, introducing like students of color to um, better like school opportunities or trying like is it really a, a it was an integration effort to diversify schools in greater Boston and she was in charge of that program from I believe like the 70s until she retired in 2017 so very long career in education but um, she's 92 now but last October um, she goes like on a walk through like where we're sitting is at Franklin Park um one of the largest parks in Boston. She goes on a walk with her dog, um, who's in the left corner every day. And then one night as she was walking, um, an assailant like stabbed her and she pretty much um, was really close to death, but she was able to fight off the attacker and just showed so much resilience and so much like love and kindness in her approach. And the story was kind of like a year later after that tragedy has this affected how she sees the park and also as a lot of the city is thinking about like what what renovations or what changes does it make in the park does this inform kind of like does this show that Franklin Park isn't safe but she was still going on her walks with her dog and just being as vibrant and as youthful and as like positive and as inspirational as ever and when I was sitting here with them she kept on saying like let me get um Tiana we should take a photo we should take a photo but I was saying like oh well, I wish I could, but like I'm a reporter and I can't take photos per se. But then we finally like got a photo together and our photographer like sent me this photo of us just laughing. And I think it really just showed, um, I was kind of like letting or making those lines like blur a little bit and just really developing a relationship with Jean that I think allowed her to trust me with telling the story and being able to show parts of her that may you may not have seen a lot of her coverage about her 
just championing education and doing so many other things. So I thought that was just like a good picture that could show kind of a uh, an antithesis or um, a contrast from the photos that you might see media traditionally portrayed as. Um, and so I have like some slides next, but I'm, I guess this might be like a place to see if anyone might have questions based on what I just said or if Alexa, if not, like if there's anything you wanted to ask me. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the Q&A, um, okay. but I had one. I'm looking at this photo and there's just such clear, you know, rapport there. You can see the trust that, you know, was built in telling the story. And I guess I'm just curious, you know, how do you sort of build trust with your sources? Mm -hmm. I think like the way that I do it is that um, I think trust means showing up when I'm not there to get a byline. And just as being a community member, I try to be just as present in different events or different things that are happening in the community, even when I'm not like writing a story. And so these people might see me at like um, different park events or, um, or just like in the grocery stores or just like different things. And I really just try to be engaged and as embedded in the community as possible. And I think that that has come to show that like, I'm really not just here when I need a story or when the globe like has come with like, we want to cover this or this or that. But I'm just, just as someone who's like embedded in there, I think they can understand that like, well, she is a part of the community too. And she has a vested interest and in turn that we can probably trust her with these stories as opposed to other parts of the newsroom. So we have a couple of questions that have filtered in um, and thank you so much for that response, Tiana. Um, so Katie asks, I feel like students are discouraged from studying English or studying journalism these days <laughs> uh, as they are viewed as dead end. Um, <laughs> so much pressure for STEM degrees. Any thoughts for our students? Yeah, oh my gosh. I was kind of laughing because I remember when I had first decided, like, so I started when I was graduating from high school, I started in English and then I added journalism longer on. I knew I wanted to study English and I vividly remember like one of my friends, not so much my friend anymore, but I remember when I said I was gonna major in English, he was like, why would you do that? Do you just want to be like flipping burgers at McDonald's? It's absolutely useless. And I was just like, well, I don't know. Growing up, my dad, um, my dad like never, um, none, neither of my parents finished college and my dad uh, kind of just chose the job that would, um, as just the sole like breadwinner, um, be able to get food for all of us on the table. So he always grew like, or woke up like not excited for work every day. So my dad always gave me the advice to do something that you love and then the money or everything will work out eventually. So that's why I chose English. And I like in school STEM, I had better grades in STEM. English were actually the ones that were a little bit lower. Like I loved writing, but it was something I could see myself doing and waking up and enjoying. And that's why I chose it. And I think what I would say for like students that are interested in English, either English or journalism, um, those degrees are so versatile. Writing is so hard. Like writing is something that you can use in anything. So even if it's like, like going to be like an English teacher or being a journalist, any field, whether it's in STEM or engineering or this or that, um, they need writers. So I think anyone with an English degree, I think it just teaches you things about writing and storytelling and literature that give you an encompassing view of the world and it could lend itself to anything. Um, so even though like I know, I know so many English and journalism um, majors that may not be doing what exactly their major might entail, they use the they, whether it was to go to law or to work at a hospital and um, write a, um, different reports or things or that, like it's needed everywhere. So I would not like let that deter anyone from that. I may have chose exactly what that, like, I guess traditionally when you think of a journalism degree, you're gonna do journalism, I might do that, but um, it could be used anywhere. So I would, I would say it's just as important or a thing that people can consider when they're figuring out what is that next step or what they want to um, focus on in college. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, I think also, so my degree is also in journalism. I worked as a journalist and also in, in, in education. And I think, you know, 
we're always going to need good communicators <laughs> and journalists are, you know, some of the best also critical thinkers, you know, they might not be a mathematician, but they're able to ask the right questions about that data to contextualize it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in the previous slide, when we, you know, saw those depictions of journalists that that can, you know, be cool, but a lot of the times it's a grind. Uh, you're out there, you're doing the hard work. Um, and so it's, you know, not super glamorous, uh, death defying stunts that some of these movies depict. Um, you know, you're out there and you're telling really important stories. So um, we actually have a few more questions okay, um, and then and then we'll kind of carry on with your slides. Um, okay. So Krista and this, you might actually have some slides. This really kind of gets down to like really uh, the title of also the session. So Krista asks, so where sits the balance between impartial or unbiased journalism um, and those personal stories and experiences um, that different communities have? Where do you kind of find that balance between you know, fairness and impartiality and being a community member? Yeah, so I think where I really try to find the balance is covering parts of the community where um, I may not necessarily agree with, like, politically or socially, or I may not have agreements or personally, like, agree with the way that they're carrying out things, but they're just as a part of the community, and I think in the end goal, a lot of them have the same ideas, or, like, we can agree that, like, I want the, I want black Bostonians to have like a safe, stable home, or I want them to have clean streets or this or that. They may not, they may go a a certain way about it. I think covering that like kind of lends me to like being impartial and not trying to feed my own ego or interject my own personal opinions into things. But I also think that um, I try to also um, kind of challenge what objectivity is by like with like Miss Jean McGuire really spending time with people and building relationships or um, just like really providing a, like a, a, a source of like, or a place for empathy in ways that maybe traditional journalism or impartiality may not lend itself to. I feel like just, I'm only like two and a half years into journalism and it's still like something that I'm still trying to figure out. And um, maybe my answer to that question will change as I continue on in this career it's something really hard. And I think it's something that the industry is still trying to figure out, but I think that's how I try to answer it in the stories that I do. Great. Um, And then let's do one more question. um, And then please everyone keep using that Q and A. And then I'm going to let Tiana carry on. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. There's so many good ones. Uh, So as a community reporter, would you describe your coverage as up close and personal features as opposed to quote, hard news? If so, isn't it okay to blur those relationship lines as you say? I would say it's both. Like my, um, just in covering black communities, like my stories, whether it's featuring people on the ground or it's writing about like a certain government institution or an entity in the city that um, that whose actions have like really large stakes or large impact on that community. It's, I do a little bit of everything. Um, I think even though it's specific on black communities, um, that area of coverage is so broad that anything can fly into that. And then I just wanna make sure the second part of the question is how they- so- Right. Um, I think the question, and I might have lost it because there's so many good ones. Um, so I'll just repeat the whole question. Yeah, I'm so sorry. As, <laughs> no, no, that's totally fine. Um, as a community reporter, would you describe your coverage as up close and personal features, more like feature writing, uh, as opposed to, quote, hard news? And if it is feature writing, is it OK to blur those relationship lines? Yeah, I guess like in feature writing, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there's any like long doing and um, spending time with a person and really showing that you're invested in their story. But I also try to draw the line of, for example, if I've really built a relationship with someone, if they're like 
oh, well, can you actually not put that in the story? Or I don't know how I feel about this or that. Or once we've developed a relationship, really trying to like get me to serve as a mouthpiece for them or always going to me and being like, hey, I know we've built this repertoire. Can you do this, this or that? I think that's where I push back and be like, hey, I know that we've spent, I've spent a lot of time like telling your stories, but I'm still a reporter and we gotta, we gotta, um, we gotta break it off at some point. Like I'm, um, I'm here to do my job, and that's first and foremost. This is my job, so um, that's how I try to do it. It is hard, though. Yeah, I, I can, you know, imagine. You know, you want you're there to do your job and do it well, and and be a professional. Um, but a lot of the times, if you want to get those more, you know, natural quotes, if you want someone to feel more comfortable being, you know, interviewed with a lot of times people have never sat down and talked to a journalist. So you have to kind of have, find that balance of also being human, I imagine. Um, yeah. This kind of reminds me. So when I worked at the Tampa Bay Times, there was a journalist there. Um, her name's Landa Gregory, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Oh, yeah. And she wrote this, yeah, she wrote this series called uh, The Girl in the Window. So yes. I recommend to all of you read that. And I was sitting in the newsroom and she was kind of, um, she was talking about that series. And this was, you know, years later. Um, and she was talking about how she actually, you know, got invited in by the mother of the child to sit in and, you know, have cupcakes. And she was fully expecting a slam in the door um, and having that kind of human side and trying to kind of connect and build a relationship. The story just had so much more depth to it. Um, so, yeah, quick sidebar on that. Um, again, these questions are really fantastic, but I'm just going to give Tiana back her time to kind of okay. go through the presentation um uh, but please be using the q a yeah um not too much to go so i hope i can still answer whatever you guys might have um yeah so kind of just like with these next few slides i kind of like said that like with community reporting there's a lot of like um pluses to it but also some things that come as like a lot of drawbacks or things that I still am trying to work out and kind of um, reckon with in this role. So I think like one of the things with community reporting is that when I'm like down or on the ground and engaging with people and um, having those face-to-face -face interactions, I think it gives me the space to provide, like, like I'm able to provide empathy or really interject my emotions and things in the ways that other reporters can't, like if they might be reporting on like city hall or like at the state house or like reporting on these different um, government institutions that um, have a lot to answer or that um, are held accountable like by reporters and also just in general like who's funding their taxpayer or all the, all the taxpayers that they have to answer to and with community reporting like I think that in just trying to blur these lines of or not blurring these lines, but trying to um, define for myself what impartiality is and um, what objectivity really means to me. Like, I think that just in this institution or whether it's the globe that's been around for 150 years or just journalism that's a centuries old practice, I think I get a chance to introduce change or maybe with a lot of our um, leaders in journalism, really getting them to interrogate what objectivity really means and what parts can we keep and then what parts do you think are might be outdated or we might have to look at it again and really think about is this the right thing or is this um what journalism really needs in this moment and then i think with whether it's me just doing community reporting i think just covering black communities in general um i think there's a higher like level of trust or i think people can go to me with their stories um specifically people who've been harmed by journalism so like in other words Black Bostonians, Black people in general, um, I think just seeing a face that looks like them or allows them to share stories with me, they may not be comfortable doing with other people. Um, and I think also just as someone who's also been harmed by journalism, I think that we can find a common ground and we'll be able to, um, I'm trying to think of how to say this, but this is someone that can, has been in their shoes and that I'm covering or I'm working in an institution that has harmed me as well. Um, 
I think that they can, can see that I am really trying to change um, or repair those harms. And so that allows me to, I think, different avenues or different access or different things that other people may not have. Um, but then like there are also definitely some sacrifices like for like I'm I'm Tiana Woodard of the Boston Globe covering black communities. I'm the only person covering black communities and I'm going against 150 years of precedent and also a lot of people that have been in this institution or in journalism much longer than me where if I'm one person and it's definitely not going to be overnight where people really start to change how they view journalism and what mission or how it can really serve the community. Like it'll probably take like more lifetimes than me to really get about that. So that's something I always have to think about and give myself grace for when things may not work out as I'd like them to. And I think also in being a community reporter, like it's really, really hard to, um, when you're covering black people, like taking off your reporting hat and certain things where I might be in an event and I'm just coming as Tiana Woodard, but people are like, oh, you are at the Boston Globe. Like, what about this story or this or that or this or that? And so, or there's also like a kind of a, a, a dilemma for me where like, if I'm going to this event, this is me, should I be covering this? Like, am I doing a, like a disservice by just showing up as myself or, should I be covering this or thinking about this in a journalistic lens as well? So that's something I think in just covering communities that I may have a burden with compared to other beats or other areas of coverage. And then just, I don't know if this is like me just being a community reporter, but probably just me personally, like um, just as one person that's covering our communities, I feel like there's not as much grace or as much terms for slip ups or mistakes as other beats or or other people might give themselves grace but it's um it's a large like responsibility and i think that that's something that is really difficult and something that's heavy on my shoulders if i do this work um but yeah i can also from there also take like more questions yeah, I, I just also want, you know, to this point, um, I want to let educators know about our free Chicology lesson called Parm and Distrust. Um, and I think you could really apply a lot of what Tiana is talking about when students are going through that lesson, um, because there is a lot of um, institution, there have been a lot of institutional news organizations that have legacies of exclusion and blatant harm. Um, that have severely eroded a lot of trust among specific groups of people. So um, that lesson kind of goes through coverage from Jim Crow, civil rights, the late 20th century. Um, and it also kind of dives into the role of the, that the Black press played in providing more accurate, urgent, critical coverage, especially during, you know, some of the atrocities that were happening. And also looks at kind of the sharp contrast um, from mainstream news organizations at that time. So I just want to kind of plug that, that it's one of our, you know, newest Czechology lessons. And I think it would be really applicable to what you're talking about, Tiana. Um, but now let's go back to some questions from educators in the audience. Um, Paula would also really love to know just where you get your ideas for, for your, for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's a mixture of um, kind of looking into myself and wondering like what are my interests there is what unique perspectives or for me like what do I think that the community could learn from or that might serve the community and I think a lot of my stories really do come from like at the end of my interviews I always ask like what else should we be covering or what um, what is the globe doing wrong or like what would you like to see more from us and a lot of the answers that like um, people from the community have given me based on that question, I would say that's like the vast majority of the stories that I do. Um, so it's kind of like looking on um, kind of my own like personal passions and interests and then definitely also um, based on what people are telling me or what feedback or what comments they might have. Awesome. Um, so we have an another question. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about kind of um, possibly going into the field of journalism. Um, but this person asks, could we say, so, you know, 
I'm assuming to students, could we say to students that journalism helps someone ask the right questions? Um, how does one prepare to develop that kind of curiosity? That's a good question. Look like you asked the right questions. I'm like, I'm yeah. trying to figure out. <laughs> These people are asking the right questions. <laughs> yeah, like I think that journalism or just being in this work, like I started um, out in journalism, like at my high school newspaper in like 2014 at this point. Like I graduated at 2017. So I guess probably for a lot of educators, you'll probably still think I'm a baby because I am, but um just the questions and um that I can think of when I was asking at first um to the questions that I might ask now I think lend themselves to like a level of nuance that being a journalist has made me really think about and I think just also as I've gotten older and experienced different things um my questions have taken a new form too but I think journalism does like um prepare you to ask the right questions because I think it just in doing the work and in um, whether it's going to J school or just um, um, pursuing this in another way, I think it prepares you to think about like um, and, and sort of an idea like what gaps are there and then asking those questions to fill those gaps or also just like an opportunity to ask questions that might challenge the narrative that you see in front of you. Um, yeah, like I think it's, um, journalism is a very, yeah, like I think it has like lended me to ask the right questions or think about things or really think about things, I think, in a broader context and trying to see like what fits there, what fits this and what I can ask to fill those. So I think it really does. And um, whether it's in J school or even just like taking a class or something like that, like I think it could benefit everyone, even if they may not see journalism as their final or their career path or where they want to see themselves in this many or so years. Well, to answer the question. Yeah. Uh, so when you when you kind of go in, when you're going preparing for an interview or you're, mm -hmm. you know, at the interview, um, do you kind of go in with a list of questions or do you try to have that conversation and see what kind of questions arise during it? Or is it kind of both? Oh, I'm sorry. Or is it kind of both? Yeah, when I was first starting in high school, I would always have a list of questions and I would never veer from that. I think that from that, my journalism, I wasn't really being an active listener. And so I would always be thinking, okay, okay they're saying this, but I had to think this next question and make sure I get to number three or number four. And um, over time, like, or even now, a lot of times I do not like write down questions unless there's something where my editor is specifically like, I want to make sure you have this or this. I'll write that down to make sure I don't forget. But a lot of it is listening or hearing what they have to say, asking follow-ups for that and letting the conversation flow. And I think my journalism has gotten better about that because I think journalists are always focused on asking the questions, but it's also taught me to be a better active listener and really think about what they're saying. Um, so now, like, it's like, I don't really write them, but I think for people starting out, it probably is important, but I would not like try and just think about those questions and really think about what they're saying. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I taught journalism and that was definitely the case. Um, I would have a student have a bunch of questions and then they'd be interviewing something and the interviewee would say something really cool or really <laughs> from left field and then be like, okay, yeah. And next question is, like, oh, no, 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 let's, exactly. let's go back to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I love that part about like journalism also, you know, knowing the questions, being, you know, curious enough to ask the right questions, but also, you know, you have to be able to listen so that you know what's the most logical next question to ask. Mm -hmm. Um Eleanor wants to know, how do you decide what is newsworthy? Yeah, so a lot of it is, and I think that um, but I think the industry needs to do a better job of helping the public understand this, but a lot of it is my editor determining what's newsworthy and me trying to fit into that mold or pushing about or against it in some ways, but since I'm a reporter, I report to an editor who reports to another editor and this or that. Um, a lot of it is me pitching and my editor being like, yes, this is newsworthy or this is not. And that kind of lends itself to its own challenges or sometimes where 
they may think something is newsworthy and something is not, or I might think it is. And I think that just as a reporter covering black communities, sometimes I have to do a lot more energy, I think, than other peers to determine or try to get my editor to understand if something's newsworthy. But um, I guess like in terms of me, in terms of thinking about what's newsworthy to pitch to my editor, um, I really think that what determines that for me is that like what stories might add nuance or might get readers to think about something in a different way. Um, and then also just kind of like listening in on or it's, whether it's looking on social media or looking at trends and seeing what people are searching. That also has like helped me determine like what is newsworthy where I'm trying to have journalism that answers people's deepest questions or what they're thinking about. So we're kind of also serving that mission too. Um, so that's how I do it, but a lot of it is dependent on my bosses. <laughs> yeah, I think that's also a, a big misconception that a lot of students don't don't necessarily understand, which is that journalism is very much a collective effort. There <laughs> are so many roles that um, you know are you know integral to creating good, solid works of journalism. There's editors; sure. those editors have editors. <laughs> um, and um, I think it's a good reminder that, uh, yeah, journalists are not just uh, out <laughs> left to their own devices and, you know, calling all the shots when it comes to these big coverage decisions. Mm -hmm. um, kind of speaking of, you know, coverage choices. Um, so Sarah has a question. Um, she's asking, how would you explain to students that it is important for newspapers to take an editorial stance? Mm. And when they're talking about editorial stance, like being make taking a stance on certain issues or being direct on like where we sit on this or that, or is that what they mean? Or I think that's what they're saying. I just want to make sure. Possibly. Um, and Sarah, please feel free to kind of follow up in the Q and A. Um, if um, if not, I, I'm assuming on you know editorial uh, stance being. Yeah, what you mentioned earlier, like a um, maybe about a or maybe a breaking news event, for example, or um, maybe not necessarily take an editorial stance, but how do you decide maybe where that what that coverage should look like, or how and it's necessary, or maybe how that you know these coverage choices frame certain major you know events. And Sarah, oh, Sarah says. Yes, taking a stance on controversial issues. That's a good question because I feel like it's hard for me to say in the sense that I think a lot oh, of these rooms. Are sorry, Tiana. Let me let me. She also has a, a second follow up. Just. Uh, to be clear. Um, so she says, yes, taking a stance on controversial issues by writing editorials. So I think that's the key. That's the key word there. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say because I've never been in an editorial like or been an op-ed writer. I've never been in an editorial department. Like I know, like the Boston Globe has this individual one where they might like the editorial board is saying this or that, or certain reporters might be writing op-eds on certain issues. So I I don't know if I like I feel like I would be speaking out of term or just kind of like guesstimating um just from a reporter that's in a metro site that's covering communities but i think well i know i have some experience in the sense of like if we're covering um certain things like um a mass shooting or like the israeli-palestinian conflict or certain things that um there like there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance or there's a lot of things like i think that a lot of my reporting kind of goes into thinking about like what language should we like be using? When, what language are we using when talking about these certain communities or certain people? And then what bias or what is what biases or does that say about or what does that say about how we're viewing this? Um, and like, how can we change that? Or is this right? Or are we kind of pulling our own never narrative or feeling like or giving some room for harm by that? And how do we change that? Like, I know, like, at the Globe, like, we have, like, a Slack channel that's about, it's called, like, style language, or where we have different discussions on, like, what certain words that we might be using, or this or that, or what things we should be thinking about when covering certain things like that. Um, 
So I feel like I kind of gave a non-answer, but I think it's just because um, since I don't have much editorial experience like in that way, I don't know if I can really say. Yeah, I, I think also what a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, the newsroom side, you know, reporters, um, folks that are in your role, role are very kind of intentionally separated from, you know, the opinion section of the newsroom. When I worked at the Tampa Bay Times, um, they were on a completely different floor from us, uh, exactly. in, you know, the newsroom. Um, yeah, and it's very, it is ex intentional for that reason. Um, and I think the other thing to note is that, um, an editorial piece from the newsroom doesn't necessarily mean it reflects the views of everyone who works at that news organization as well. No. Um, and it's also important for students when they are reading an opinion piece to understand what makes an opinion piece different from, you know, a straight news article. Right. Um, and also understanding the importance of these opinion pieces still being rooted in facts and evidence. Um, and that's what sets kind of a credible opinion from, you know, a reputable standard-based news organization from just anyone's editorial hot take online. Um, uh, so um, Janet kind of wants to know, um, did you kind of create this role for yourself, you know, covering the black community at, you know, or creating, becoming this community reporter for the globe, or was this an advertised position? Was the globe like actively seeking out, you know, a community reporter? Yeah. So I guess like a little bit of backstory about how this role was created is that I'm also, I'm like, I'm a full-time, like I'm a Boston globe reporter, but I'm also a core member for report for America. And what that program is, it's a national program where like their mission is to fill news deserts or gaps in media coverage and like um, throughout the country. And so they have different core members that are like about a couple hundred or so that are in the US and um, different territories that are working exactly on that. And how that program works is that newsers across the country will send an application to Report for America about um, that they are hoping to add a core member or get a reporter that can cover this part or cover this certain issue. So um, about, I guess, in 2020 or early 2021 or so, the Boston Globe applied the Report for America saying that we want someone that is covering Black communities in Boston. And so they had applied and kind of filled out this thing about like what they would like this feed to look like. And when that was, um, I, I, in college, I had applied to Report for America and that being a part of that network because I had knew some friends or some people I really looked up to that had been through it. And when I was looking through the listing and saw um, the Boston Globe was looking for that, I was really, I really was drawn to that beat. And so that's, I applied and that's how it was there. And so I guess even though the Boston Globe had this, um, had this beat description and they were, had advertised this there. I think there's also been a little bit of flexibility or autonomy in me thinking about like, what does covering a black community mean at the Boston Globe? And being able to infuse like my own experiences, um, my own ideas of how I think journalism should work and how it can um, serve like black Bostonians here. Um, and also just what the community feels that they need from us. So. Boston Globe had created it and I kind of came in and then um, added my own flavor into it, if that makes sense. Super interesting. So we do have a couple more questions, but uh, I wanna make sure you're able to get through your slides. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so, I don't right. have to do much after this. Um, yeah, it was kind of just saying like my balancing act in terms of with these pluses and then also with these sacrifices, this is kind of like a broad, um, there have been so many stories that I've written since then, um, but these are some ones from last year that I think kind of portrayed this balancing act of infusing my own um, personal experiences while also trying to make sure that I might, um, am making sure I'm covering parts of the community or covering things that um, I may not in my own personal experience either relate to or necessarily agree with in some ways. So, um, I think like, for example, um, being able to cover like Massachusetts had adopted the Crown Act. I think just as someone who 
grew up having my hair chemically relaxed until I was 18 and having those experiences and the questions I was asking and being there, I was really able to lean into that and, and telling that story. So that was where something I could using my own experiences to feed it. And then on the right here is a story about how, um, I didn't know this, but until I was writing the story, but that the Juneteenth flag was created in Boston and it was first raised in Boston. And so I was able to track down the um, guy who had created it and about that story and kind of just figuring out what was the genesis of this idea? Like, were there different flags or things that you were considering and what, how did you get to this final one? But there were pieces about him that I didn't necessarily agree with um, in terms of like, um, for example, I know that he um, had allegedly like in the eighties or so had pushed for a like gay couples um, who had children or who had adopted children for them to be separated because he didn't necessarily agree with um, their own parenting styles or had leaked that and that has happened. Or there were certain things about like his history or the way that he um, saw like anti-violence or um, the black community, like what he saw as progress or things like that personally, I didn't really agree with. Um, but even in that, like, I felt that he still like in being a Juneteenth flag creator or being a part of this community, he still kind of had a role to play or his story is really important. So I did end up writing that. So it's kind of like through all these stories I'm writing, I'm trying to make sure that um, I am giving space for everyone, but also making sure that the harm that they've done or also um, the harm that they've done or their choices, also holding those to account and making sure that I am not giving them the pass by putting them in my stories. So yeah, I hope that that like, was a good way of showing like what this balancing act looks like on a day to day. And that's really all I had. So this is just um, my email if you ever wanna reach out to me. And also I'm mostly active on, ooh, at this time it's now X, but I guess the, um, as Prince says, the ar artist formerly known as Prince, the platform <laughs> is Twitter, so. If you ever want to reach out, um, that's my handle. So yeah, <laughs> don't be a stranger. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we have uh, around 10 minutes left. So mm -hmm. I'd love if you know use those Q&As. We have uh, a couple more questions. Um, Betty asked, and I think I missed this one earlier. Um, how has that, you know, so she's referring to the woman who you were photographed with in, I believe it was Franklin Park, you said, right. um, you know, were they an inspiration to you? Uh, and did they help you think about how to approach journalism in any way? Yeah, she was such an inspiration. Um, I feel like I really, um, not the word let my guards down, but in doing that work, um, like I was thinking um, personally, like, my grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother had passed away when I was like seven or so. And when I was putting it together, she's 92. I was like, wow, that's exactly how old my grandmother would have been if she was still alive. So um, just in her, like what she was doing and just how at 92, she was doing all these things. She was an inspiration. And even just, she has such wisdom on the community, just being a lifelong resident here. Um, she... I think helped me think about like what the globe, um, what stories we could be doing and also so serving as a resource for other things. Um, so I know there's a part of inspiration and then what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry, I went on a tangent. Oh, that's no, fine. Uh, the second part of the question was, did they help you think about how to approach journalism? I think so. Um, I really think they made me think about it just in, um, Sometimes my best stories come from me just really spending a lot of time with these people and absorbing things beyond just what the story was. Because for that story, I spent probably seven hours with her <laughs> and maybe asked like, probably, I would say probably a tenth of that was questions. <laughs> I think it's because like she, um, just being 92, she has a long like she wants to talk about a lot but having that time with her I think made me a better reporter made me realize that some of those better stories are when you really 
are there beyond just the questions and really get to um, immerse yourselves in their lives and really learn about them beyond just her being this civil rights leader or this longtime teacher, really learning about her. So I think that made me think about like, um, I really need to think um, wider or just try to make sure I'm not confining this person to this one role and thinking about these other experiences that kind of have shaped them into who they are today. Wow, that's great. Um, so this, uh, uh, taking a turn from that question, mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor asked, um, or says, you know, when I briefly worked in news, um, I'd been asked to go against my ethics for a story. Uh, do you find that you get less pressure? Um, or, you know, have you ever had an instance where, um, for lack of a better word, you got the ick, <laughs> or, you know, there was a reason, you know, you had to kind of um, maybe advocate for yourself as a journalist when it comes to, you know, your own maybe personal journalistic ethics. And Eleanor, I hope you're okay with me paraphrasing that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. I feel like the, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but I think like in general, I think I've had to do that a lot of times just being in this work and working with editors that may not be a part of the Black community. I think that's something that I run into all the time where they may see a story in a way or they may think I need to do reporting or ask these sorts of questions or do these things that I may not personally agree with. Um, I cannot think of a specific example. And honestly, I don't know if it's just because I'm so new to this. I'm not sure how I've been able to address that or if I found a solution to that per se, because and I think that it's important for sometimes for a lot of, um, and as I guess Eleanor probably understands that um, a lot of our stories, I mean, in some ways they do reflect who we are, but they there is like a lot of editorial oversight and things like that that lend to the final page or what you finally see there. And so um, in some ways, like it might show like the globe's ethics or them like that's also on the page too it doesn't really speak for who you are but just being at an institution and just having a job sometimes it's hard to be able to um push back against that or really have the story or the final outcome that you would like it to be great um and this isn't a question. Mindy just says, thank you so much for all of the information. And I hope to have you into my classroom one day. Oh, um, so yeah, uh, Mindy, <laughs> yeah, Mindy totally agree with you. Um, so this may be the last question and it was mine actually. Okay. Um, so uh, if you had a magic wand, uh, and you could eliminate one major journalism misconception, um, what would it be? So in other words, uh, what is something that you wish everyone knew about being a journalist or, you know, maybe more specifically being a community reporter? What's something that you just wish everyone, including students, knew about your job? That were people too. And a lot of the comments or a lot of the things I get in my inbox, a lot of the things, like if I showed you my inbox, it would be like, oh my God. <laughs> um this is terrible um that stuff does add up and it does hurt um and I think that sometimes it's really easy when you're just thinking about the Boston Globe this is this entity in this group that when you're throwing all the stuff at it that it doesn't really have an impact but I think that a lot of those stories like behind those stories are people and I think that when critiquing or when um Saying, doing, saying this about a story or how our coverage or this or that, um, really thinking about the, like that there are people behind this and having a little bit more grace or empathy when throwing those criticisms out there. Like, sure, like we're, um, the Boston Globe has a lot of power. And I think that we are, should like, have ourselves open to criticism and feedback and um, we like are, should be held accountable by our readers, but um, a lot of it, I think that a lot of people just do not really think about <laughs> just how hurtful or how mean their their comments can be. Yeah, um, 
totally. Um, and to ask a follow up question about that, because I was, you know, actively listening to you. Uh, <laughs> how do you <laughs> how do you manage that emotional toll that reporting can sometimes take, um, especially if, you know, maybe you're also covering a difficult or, you know, possibly even tragic event? It's hard. I think really leaning on my editors, I think it's important in this that reporters know that they're long alone or that they have an editor that can support them through that. Um, I think it's also, um, I when I get like comments or this or that, I always try to tell myself to not let it, unless it's like constructive feedback or something or a question or this or that, but something that's just truly hateful or I think um, did not, they did not come into this having a dialogue and just have this or that and they just, no room for discussion, no room for conversation, like allowing it just to live like five minutes in my mind and then just moving on, not letting it consume me. I think that's still really hard, but something I try to give myself, like give it five minutes and then move on. Um, that's what I try to do, but it's really hard, especially covering black communities when I get a lot of racist and just disgusting stuff from my emails all the time. <laughs> oh gosh, I hate that for you. Um, but on, let's end on a positive, uh, okay. Anne wants to also say thank you. Thank you for sharing the intricacies of your role with us. Um, I'm also, you know, seeing a lot of, I know the chat's disabled, but there's a lot of love in the <laughs> chat and appreciation. Uh, Tiana, thank you so much for sharing with us today. You are covering important stories in our area. I am local. I would love if you might consider talking with our Black Student Union at some point. I will drop an email with a smiley face. Oh, please um, do. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Tiana, so much for joining us, for sharing your expertise. Um, for our participants, I want to let you know that our next session starts at 11 Eastern, so in a few minutes. Um, and that session is the crisis in local news um, mm -hmm. that's being led by um, the executive director for Report for America. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope to see you all in that next session. And Tiana, thank you. Thank you again so much. This has been really, really wonderful. Thank you for having me.